Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, whichever may apply to you. Uh, we are picking up where we left off, lecture 12. Uh, first part we covered, well, this is part two of covering uh, Basil of Caesarea. So in this section, we're going to be finishing off his, well, let's get to it. Oh, that's right. Again, I was fairly so I put it on the front this time. I put these these books here for you in case you didn't see the last slide at the, at the end of the last lecture. But these are some really good uh, secondary works um, that kind of really show you the breadth of Nicene theology and cover these guys that we've been talking about up till this time. Um, very very helpful, very insightful. Actually, we'll be referencing I think one of them in here. Um, so I just want to make sure you saw this slide before I move on and forget. I do plan to put it on at the end of the lecture as well. So. Um, again, Basil Caesarea. We are going to see the conclusion of his work against Eunomius, and then we're going to dive into his treatment of the Holy Spirit. Oop, jumping ahead, I think. Okay, so in this final act against Eunomius, Basil addresses the role of the Spirit, or the Spirit in general. Uh, Eunomius sees that the Spirit is from the begotten, making him third in dignity and rank, and thus he makes him third in nature. In this perspective, Eunomius claims is the sacred teaching handed down and believed by the saints. Now Basil begins his response in bewilderment at Eunomius's claim of Catholic fidelity on the spirit. He asks from where, in what writings did he learn such blasphemy? Basil offers agreement as it pertains to the rank of each person, but nowhere in scripture do we see that rank indicates nature? And he makes his argument referring to angels and that they share a single designation in nature, but there are angels that have greater responsibility as overseeing and presiding over nations, whereas there are those who are designated as personal angels to God's children, like Matthew 18.10. We can think of uh, the prince and Daniel having a, a certain authority. We can think of the various ones throughout the Bible that we see. So Basil quotes Old Testament passages showing the angels that have greater dignity as well as legions of angels at the call of Christ if the Father wills so he would will it, Matthew 26, 53. So his point is to show that there are angels who are princes and others who are servants, and all are angels in nature. While they differ in dignity, there is communion in nature. And therefore the Spirit likewise, even if he's subordinate in rank, Numbered third in the baptismal confession of salvation from Matthew 20 18. Nowhere in scripture do we see that the, that the spirit is a third foreign nature of some sort. Something different other than the essence and nature of God. So to further support his argument, Basil defers to the dividing line, the two realities, divinity and creation, sovereignty and servitude, sanctifying power and sanctified power sanctifying power, excuse me, and sanctified power, of which the former reality belongs to one by virtue of its nature, the latter is by virtue of free will. And then he poses the question, which reality belongs to the spirit? Scripture testifies that the spirit by nature belongs to the first reality. We see this in John 14, 17, 15, 26, and 16, 13. Holiness by nature is observed in three subsistences, subsistences, uh, John 4.24, Lamentations 4.20, and 2 Corinthians 3.17. So while the names given or in reference to the Spirit reveal his divine nature, Basil goes on to discuss his activities. He says he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He perfects creatures. The power of the Spirit pervades the universe. The Spirit is the seal of adoption for believers. He is the true teacher just like the Lord. Distributes gifts to those whom he wills, knows the mind of God, and therefore can rightly judge the secrets of man, and lavishes eternal life on us through and in Christ. And sorry if you are listening, uh, you don't see the slide, and I have all the, the Bible passages that go with that. So in light of the scriptural testimony to the nature and activity of the Spirit, he does not have a third nature, but has the one and only divine nature shared by and in the Father and the Son. Eunomius insists that the Spirit was created by the begotten, bereft of divinity and creative power. 
Uh, Basil takes note of the spirits indwelling in us, the body of Christ, which scripture says that the spirit of God dwells in the body. Therefore, to deny that he shares in divinity is impious. And then Basil makes, sorry, Basil, I blew it. Basil makes a comparison to the spirit's divine quality and the creature's divine quality, which touches on the doctrine of deification. Deification is very popular in the early church fathers, which kind of really maintained uh, its um, sustenance, if you will, in the Eastern tradition. The Western tradition didn't really engage in that too much. Uh, there's some noticeability of it in Calvin and some others, but actually in our modern reform period, uh, we are seeing a resurgence of theosis, deification, kind of the same thing. I think people are very off-put by it because they maybe have a familiarity with it uh, in the Mormon tradition, which we know is heretical. And the Mormons believe that you actually do become gods. But the Eastern Orthodox version of it, um, ultimately, we would say is is consistent with Scripture. Um, and I, again, not everybody can can hold to it or holds to it, but I think it's a very, I think the one they the view they offer is an Orthodox uh, perspective. And again, people can find it. Agreeable in scripture or not, um, I, I think it's a very um, uh, appropriate a way of, of interpreting the Bible, understanding what God does to us as creatures. And so we share, we participate in the divinity of Christ by being united to him in, the, in his person through the Spirit. All right, anyways. So the, where was that? Sorry. Okay. Um... Okay, yeah, and then, and then Basil makes a comparison to the Spirit's divine quality and the, and the creature's divine quality, which touches on the doctrine of deification. Obviously, I said that. And he writes, Moreover, it is impious to say of the Spirit, as one can say of human beings, that the divinity honored in him comes by participation and does not coexist with him by nature. For the one divinized by grace possesses a nature subject to change and falls away from the better state whenever he is careless. The baptismal formula of saving faith is a creature's ascent to divinity. So while there is a ranking in the formula, nevertheless, it is in this formula that one is saved and made holy. So kind of going back to his quote, he said here that he's making the comparison between the human being and the spirit, right? He says it's impious, it's, it's blasphemous to say of the spirit something of the same of, div, of humans, whereas the divinity honored in him, in man, right, comes by participation and does not coexist with him by nature. We are not by nature divine, right? The one divinized by grace, that's where this, this theosis comes in or deification. We are creatures that are divinized by grace, we possess a nature subject to change, which is our humanity, and falls away from the better state whenever he is careless. So as the spirit cannot fall away from uh, holiness, because he is by nature holy, a human right, can fall away from holiness because of his nature is not holy in itself. We are given holiness, we share in holiness, we share in the spirit of God. Same, same kind of thing. hope that was helpful. Um, because Eunomius cannot comprehend that the spirit is beyond creation, he utters blasphemous assertions. Basil appeals to our finitude and inability to know the spiritual things. However, in our ignorance and lack of epistemic breadth of all reality, even the things we can see, we have been taught through divine revelation that the spirit is one with the Father and the Son, in which we confess as the Blessed Trinity, thus also preserving the singleness of the Trinity. So we concluded there with Eunomius, and we are now going to move on to uh, Basil's treatment on the Spirit. It's his last book. Um, I'm sorry, his last book that we were we were looking at, he, he was very you know very brief on the Spirit. But his treatise here is much more theologically rigorous and detailed in its exegesis. And it actually is one of the first works to fo focus expressly on the Spirit. And if you remember, we talked about that uh, previously, how he was kind of employed or, you know, to, to do this, to do this work to really help. Uh, you know, obviously the issues they're dealing with, there is something needed. This was needed to really combat 
um, the heresy that was, again, pervading into uh, the Orthodox perspective. So, so while this book is on the spirit, what's what it called? Obviously, they weren't very big on these um, illustrious titles. Um, they're on the spirit, name of a book. Basil doesn't engage heavily into his arguments about the spirit until chapter 9. So he begins this work examining the heretics, which would be the Arians, examining their use of syllables to distort the doctrine of the Trinity. And we'll talk about the syllables here in a second. So they, the, her the heretics, they posit that when Scripture uses prepositional phrases, which he says syllables, now prepositions, do you guys and gals, if you're listening watching, know what a preposition is? All right, so if I actually look at the title that I have up there, on the spirit, on the spirit. So on is a preposition. If you say above the clouds, below the clouds, those are prepositions. They, they designate a position of something, locating towards something. So in, through, by, those are all things connected to the noun. So when he's saying they use these phrases, these calls them syllables, speaking of the activity of God, right? So if God saves you by grace, right, that indicates relationship. So by is the manner in which God saves. So by grace, you are saved by grace. Um, just lost my place. Okay. Um, yeah, they, they, again, speaking of the Arians, they posit that when Scripture uses prepositional phrases, he calls syllables here, speaking of the activity of God, these, fra these phrases create a subordinate ranking which makes the Son and the Spirit of a different nature from the Father. So the heresy is promoted as such in the, in the words of the Apostle. One God and Father of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom are all things. Whatever then he goes on is the relation of these terms to one another. Such will be the relation of the natures indicated by them. And as the term of whom is unlike the term by whom, so is the Father unlike the Son. So in following this manner of thought, the differing prepositions taxonomize the Father from the Son and the Spirit from the Son and the Father. And taxonomy has to do with orders of classes, classifications. Um, so he's saying here that by these prepositions that we see in the Scripture, they are actually creating subordinate categories based upon the prepositions. And in the Jehovah's Witnesses kind of do the same, so you can see that in how they try to interpret these passages. But we will work through this and see the logical clarity um, being overlooked, which Basil does very well to establish in his refutation. So, they would say, the Son is a subordinate agent or instrument through whom the Father creates, and the Spirit is subordinate to the Son in whom the Father creates, whereby the Spirit may appear to be adding to existing things nothing more than a contribution derived from place or time. Uh, Basil pauses briefly to discuss the nature of the heathen philosophy that forms the basis of this faulty logic. See, the heretics have ado adopted this mode of thinking, whereby the heathens attribute attributes excuse me certain natures or give certain significations when discussing the nature of causality i.e. the four causes formal efficient material and final causes these are four key distinctions the four causes um, grounded in logic grounded uh, in the Greek philosophy which really are very helpful um, in understanding the way of causality the way we get from an effect or cause to effect. So, formally, what are these things? So, formal is the form or idea according to which a thing is made. Efficient causality is the agent acting on the thing made. And material is out of which a thing is made. And final is the end to which a thing is made or purposed. So, this here establishes the manner of causality when you look at anything. Um, obviously, we would say that um, creatures, right, though the formal idea is according to God's plan, God's mind, right, efficiently wise, he brings about, he's the acting agent to make us. The material 
Now that's where we get kind of kind of kind of fuzzy here, but obviously we say God created out of nothing. So what is the material? Well, we'd say that nothing but God created. That material part is a challenge, obviously, when it comes to um, ontology and, and understanding creation. Uh, but ultimately, God created out of His mind, out of out of His own thoughts, if you will. We're using analogical language here because we have no idea to even understand what this material is. But we know that all materials comes from God. He brings being into existence in the final the final cause means to what end to which end is this thing made so the end of us being made is to what to glorify god that is the ultimate end so hope that's helpful but we'll kind of talk through this a little bit more and kind of work out this uh this response that he has to come up with so um so romans eleven thirty six and first corinthians 8 6 affirm the, the centrality of the triune god in creation whereby God is the source, he's the sustainer, and the goal is of all, to all things. So here's the passages. For from him and through him and to him are all things, to him be glory forever. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So it seems that Paul understood this was common language in Greek Stoicism, which Hellenistic Jews adopted and applied to Yahweh. Paul then borrows and applies these to attribute to the Triune God. So in his opponent's adaptation of the four causes, and look at if you look at the, the slide I have here, the red would be the, the opponent's adaptation, they assert from whom is proper to the Father, thus he is the carpenter, right? through which, or through him, signifies the instrument, thus the sun, and of which the material of the thing that is made, and in which refers to somewhere in time and space. And it is this last element of causality that they designate to the role of the spirit. So we can see the from is proper to the father, through is through the sun, and also somehow in the sun uh, indicates the material of the thing that is made, and in which refers to somewhere in time and space, which ultimately would be what would be the spirit that does that. And so we see that they have made an unpractical philosophy and belittling doctrine of the spirit. What is the result? Basil asks. He says, there is one nature of cause, another of instrument, another of place. So the son is by nature distinct from the father as the tool from the craftsman, and the spirit is distinct in so far as place or time is distinguished from the nature of tools or from that of them that handle them. So just thinking, I mean, a very easy way to think of, of this instrumental cause, we would say that um, as an ax is laid to the wood, right? So I'm the formal cause, right? And the efficient would be the instrument, which would be the instrument, which would be the ax. And then the final cause would be to obviously cut something down. So that's a way of, of looking at it. So the thought is that Jesus is merely just this instrument that God uses to, to create. In, in Jesus, and that's where the, the heresy comes in also, is that, that Jesus having the material flesh and the person, that this, this you know created being that God created sometime, again, Jehovah's Witnesses say that, the material is bound up in him somehow. He is that material being that can now bring material into existence. Now, I don't know if that's kind of monolithic, but that is uh, kind of a, a strand of thought when it comes to looking at the fourfold causes of Christ uh, as a creature, right? as a creature, then creating everything. And it's just that God needed to create Jesus and make him flesh, so then he could now create everything. But obviously, flesh happened in time and space. So now they say, you know, obviously the Logos took on flesh, so was Jesus really in the flesh creating? Well, obviously we know he wasn't, but that's just kind of a muddled area that you see in um, Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, their theology. Okay. So uh, Basil does not continue looking for scriptural proofs for his point. Rather, he wants to engage in a discussion about the identity of language. Now remember, in the very, very first lesson, which... Unfortunately, I don't have the video for it. I have the audio, and I'll, I'll do the video when I'm done with this kind of a series. It's about language. It's about divine grammar, a way of talking about God and talking about it in a way that doesn't muddle things and, and brings precision to our articulation of our doctrine of God. So again, 
So his adversaries contend that the difference in language indicates a different in nature. A difference in language indicates a different in nature. And this is the, the crux of the argument that the Cappadocians are hammering hard is that they do not. Their names, their relationships, they don't dictate or indicate nature. However, Basil is confident, gosh, Basil, Basil is confident that they will confess with shame that the essence is unchanged. In the next chapter, Basil outlines his opponent's heretical notions, as mentioned already, challenging their assertion that the Son is after the Father. Their interpretive mistake in delineating an ontology is in using the divine economia, the redemptive revelation of God in time and space, to formulate their doctrine of God. And we've been using those words economia, economy, uh, theologia, uh, theology. Um, they have different distinctions when it comes to um, one, there is the, the theologia, which refers specifically to the uh, the um, the inner trinity, uh, God in himself, we would say. Um, the economy is now God revealing outside of himself what we actually perceive as creatures. Um, okay. So the Arians' interpretation is defective because they allow an anthropomorphic reading of the text to govern their ontology. So in refutation, Basil looks to a plain reading of John 1.1, 1, 1, observing the two words, the beginning and was. These two words keep us tethered to the text and that we have nowhere to go conceptually, leaving us with the notion that it is impossible to get further than the beginning, which teaches us to think that the Son was together with the Father in the beginning. The controlling skopos, which is the Greek word for the scope, and we see it in, I think, Philippians 2, 4, and through other passages, but it's using specifically here, but the scope of Scripture, the skopos of Scripture, is a particular summary and centralizing principle of Scripture leading us, I'm sorry, that was a, I should have got, that's a typo there, I'm sorry, no leading, Centralizing, script, uh, centralizing principle of scripture, which teaches the Bible as a whole, reveals that Christ is fully human and fully divine. So that's the centrality of scripture. The unity of the Bible reveals to us that Christ is fully human and fully divine. And that was a very uh, pressing governing theme in the early church. Therefore, this unifying theme makes individual texts of scripture that appear to be contradictory complementary of one another because scripture is a product of the one divine mind. And I got ex, uh, you know, exposed to this through uh, Craig Carter's book on contemplating God as he examined early church writers and, and kind of came to this conclusion. This is not just his conclusion, it's a, a well-accepted um, understanding that, um, again, this is where we want to make sure that we interpret in a manner that's consistent uh, regarding his divinity and his humanity. Another thinker, again, I mentioned his book earlier, but Khaled and Atalius identifies the key aspects of this unifying skopos about Christ, the central figure of Scripture. He notes this unifying principle is based on the names and language about, about Christ observed in the New Testament authors, such as uh, wisdom and power of God, 1 Corinthians 1.24, and the brightness of his glory, Hebrews 1.3. The related or shared language with throughout all of Scripture, the biblical writers employed to speak of the divine essence, as in the radiance of light, he's a speaker of a word, wisdom and power, and are then lexically extended to include Christ. When we say lexically extended, we mean the range of that word can now include Christ. And this governing principle seemingly oversteps the contextual distance between different usages. The principle of the unity of Scripture is assumed to legitimate, sorry, assumed to legitimate the, um, the meaningfulness of its intertextual relations. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that there is no element, no aspect of the revealed text that this semantic range, this lexical meaning, cannot traverse across the, the all the pages of Scripture. And I'll, I'll bring this down a little bit here. I thought I already had this paragraph. I think I'm jumping ahead of myself. I'll get to it. All right. Sorry. Let me get back on track. Um, and we see Basil making that connection. He notes his, oppo his opponent's mistake in applying 
corporeal designations to the incorporeal essence. Again, that's the anthropomorphic reading that governs the ontology. Um, and again, the examples of, of interpreting expressions in this way, we see Psalm, Psalm 1.10.1, where it says, Sit at my right hand. In Hebrews 1.3, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And they see these as God having a physical right hand uh, and that it indicates a lower rank, but rather equality of relation. The son's act of standing and sitting is not inferiority. Rather, Basil writes, it is indicative of the immutability and immobility of the divine mode of existence. And then we see the lexical extension, thus Christ's inclusion in the divine essence as spoken above. Basil writes, Scripture puts before us the magnificence of the dignity of the Son by the use of dignified language indicating the seat of honor, end quote. And then he references 1 Corinthians one twenty four. we saw, Colossians one fifteen, Hebrews one three, and John 5.27, asking his opponents if the language referring to Christ that presume his inherent relation to God signify inferiority of rank. And he demonstrates his opponent's error in their assumption that the phrase, through him, makes the word an instrument of God, thus inferior to God by the role of the word in the creative and providential acts which alone belong to the Creator. Scripture, however, credits the Son, the Word, with having brought forth all created nature, the visible and invisible, which cannot be sustained and upheld apart from the Creator Word, the only begotten God. Basil notes, He enlightens those in ignorance, John 1, 9. He judges, for the Father has given all judgment to him, John 5, 22. He is the resurrection, eleven twenty five, raising those who have fallen. And effectually working by the touch of his power and the will of his goodness, he does all things. And then, from the glory, power, and goodness of his touch in a foray, Basil attributes all the excellencies of the divine essence to Christ. He says, hold on, drink first. He shepherds, he enlightens, he nourishes, he heals, he guides, he raises up, he calls into being things that were not. He upholds what has been created. Thus, the good things that come from God reach us through the Son, who works in each case with greater speed than speech can utter. For not lightnings, not light's course in air is so swift, not eyes sharp turn, not the movements of our very thought. Nay, by the divine energy is each one of these in speed further surpassed, than is the lowest, slowest of all living creatures outdone in motion by birds or even winds or the rush of the heavenly bodies or, not to mention these, by our very thought itself. For what extent of time is needed by him who, quote, upholds all things by the power, by the word of his power, end quote, and works not by bodily agency, nor requires the help of hands to form and fashion, but holds in obedient following and unforced consent the nature of all things that are. So the work of the Son is to reveal the Father, guiding us to the knowledge of the Father, in referring our wonder at all that is brought into existence to Him, to the end that through Him we may know the Father. So Basil's cogent and clear elucidation of the Word is the summation of Scripture about Christ. The unifying theme of Scripture is that the triune God has revealed himself in Christ. Therefore, the triune God is neither tethered to time nor confined to any page, book, or testament of Scripture. It is a canonical revelation that should guide our interpretation and formulation of our doctrine of God. The divine activity of God is the divine activity of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The divine energia though manifesting the persons of the Trinity in distinct modes and activities, the the divine economia, or economy, I should probably make it easier for myself and just put economy. Anyways, in distinct modes and activities in the economia, nevertheless must always be understood that there is no variation or separation in the divine essence or in the divine operations. Operations. Basil writes, The word is full of his father's excellences. 
He shines forth from the Father and does all things according to the likeness of him who begat him. Therefore, he is the same in essence, he is the same in power. The power and operation are always equal because of the one divine will. The Son comes to execute the Father's command, but what we see in the divine economy is not a denigrating of the Son. Basil is very keen to the Arian errors, noting that the interaction revealed between the Father and the Son does not imply the Son's ontological subservience to the Father. Rather, Basil emphasizes that we must theologize according to what is befitting of the Godhead, who is Spirit. The Father and the Son perceive a transmission of will like a reflection of an object in a mirror, mirror passing without note of time from Father to Son. So keeping the distinction between economy and theology, Basil notes when the Son announces that he only speaks what he hears the Father speak, or he only does what the Father commands him to do, the purpose is to make plain that the Son has an indissoluble union with the Father. So when Christ tells Philip, the one who has seen me has seen the Father, in John 14, 9, it is not the express image or the form of God that Philip sees, because the divine nature does not admit of combination. Rather, to see the Father in Christ is to see the goodness of the will of God being concurrent with the essence, beheld as like and equal, or rather the same, in the Father as in the Son. In conclusion, Basil expresses that the Father's act of creating through the Son is the confession of an antecedent cause and is not adopted in objection to the efficient cause. So what does that mean? It means the revelation of God as creator and cause in Scripture is the expressive act of the divine essence, the theologia, whereby the modes and operations of the triune God are manifested in creation, the economia, to display the glory of God to creatures. So again, when I say modes... We don't see like God takes on certain modes like modalism. It's the manner of God revealing himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. It's the, it's the mode of operation specific to that person. So the Father doesn't do what the Son does. The Son has a, a specific act he does according to his mode as Son. Now granted, everything they do is one divine act, but the, we know because God is triune, there's a relation of persons between the three and that is their mode of being in the one being of God. Their mode of who they are, the, the mode that makes them who they are, their the relations to each other. The Son is distinct from the Father. So the distinction is manifested in the mode of each person of the Godhead in the divine economy. I hope that made sense. So the, the identity of language shared between the Father and the Son is for the purpose of indicating that one will of God in creation and providence. The prepositional phrases, Basil term syllables, the by, through, and in, ascribed to the persons of the Godhead, do not imply taxonomic degradation. Rather, it is a formulaic expression of divine accommodation. Basil's attention to the inseparable union of the Father and the Son in essence and activity sets the foundation to seamlessly shift into his argumentation about the Spirit. And if he is, is successful in persuading his critics that the Son and the Father are one, then he will not need to elaborate extensively about the Spirit's inseparable union with the Father and the Son. Delineating the, the identity of language, whereby a clear rule emerges a lexical extension or sharing of terms proper to the divine essence and inclusiveness of the Son, which will also extend to the Spirit because the terms of excellency likewise are attributed to him in Scripture. To simplify that, if Basil has proven, gosh, Basil, Basil, sorry, if Basil has proven the Son is fully divine as the Father, then adding another person to the mix should not be problematic. All right, chapter 9. Here Basil outlines the common conceptions in scripture about the spirit along with the divine epithets properly belonging to the spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, Matthew 12, 28, and the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, John 15, 26. He is termed the Holy Spirit because he is without form, not subject to change and variation as creatures are. He is of the supreme nature of the Father, since Scripture says, God is Spirit, John 4, 24. Therefore, considering the scriptural teaching about the Spirit, Basil then says, we are compelled to advance in our conceptions to the highest and to think of an intelligent essence in power infinite, in magnitude unlimited, and unmeasured by times or ages. Basil proceeds to list all of the designations of God that belong to the Spirit, concluding that the Spirit is in essence simple, fully co-inhering in the Godhead, impassively divided, is shared in fullness without loss like a sunbeam, whose kindly light falls on him who enjoys it as though it is shown for him alone, and sending forth grace sufficient for all mankind. Basil seems to prefer the analogy of a sunbeam with regards to the Spirit to denote his effects on those whom God extends his grace. These become spiritual in that the Spirit indwells and illumines them, revealing the will of God. The telos of the Spirit in creatures is to disclose the foreknowledge of the future, reveal hidden divine mysteries, uh, Basil notes in, is the the particular function of the Spirit, and distribute gifts which belong to those who are citizens of heaven. The Spirit's abiding in creatures is to bring them joy without end. The grace of fellowship is the work of the Spirit, whereby a creature through participation is being made God. Basil remarks reflect the same teachings of Athanasius with his famous expression that Christ was made like man so we could be made like God. And Gregory of Nazianzus similarly states, By the power of the Incarnation, he make me God. End quote. Now obviously you hear those terms and you probably kind of freak out a little bit, thinking, oh, he's speaking of us that we could be as God. Now granted, they understand that a creature is distinct from the Creator, but they understand that the purpose of God making us unto his image, right, is to make us like God is to bring us as close to divinity as possible, though we are creatures. And that is the work of Father, Son, Spirit in redeeming us, in giving us his spirit, in transforming us into uh, children of light. So though the work of the Spirit, I'm sorry, through the work of the Spirit comes our restoration to paradise, and that we have been brought to glory, being made partakers of the grace of Christ called children of light, in which now and forever we live in a state of fullness of blessing and enjoyment in God. In chapter 16, Basil reiterates his primary intention in this treatise. He says, To demonstrate that the Spirit is inseparable from the Father and the Son as observed in his operations. Well, I'm sorry, he doesn't say that. I summarize what he's saying. Uh, Basil refers to Paul's teaching about the spiritual gifts, emphasizing that the, while, this, while they are diverse, they come... Just realized my mic wasn't close to me. Hopefully I got it all. Darn it. Basil refers to Paul's teaching about the spiritual gifts, emphasizing that while they are diverse, they come from the same Spirit and the same Lord. That's from 1 Corinthians 12, 3 through 5. Every operation of the Spirit is conjoined with and inseparable from the Father and the Son. Not only is the Spirit present of his own will in dispensing gifts to the church, but he will, was also fully present in the creation of all things. Basil notes that while the mode and manner of creation is left a mystery, and that we can only perceive of the creation through our senses, nevertheless, through epinoia, remember that term, epinoia, conceptualizing things, we can form an analogy of the unseen, glorify the maker by whom all things were made, visible and invisible, principality and powers, authorities, thrones and dominions, and all other reasonable natures whom we cannot name. And from this analogy... Oops, page here. We can conceive, we conceive that the Father is the original cause, by his will all things subsist, that the Son is the creative cause, through whom all things are brought into being, and the Spirit is the perfecting cause, in whom the Spirit's presence perfects. But Basil quickly qualifies that in the operations, though delineated in what appear to be distinct, separate actions, a thing's coming into existence and the sustaining of a thing's subsistence is carried out by one creating through the Son and perfecting through the Spirit. 
So following this understanding of the economy, or economia, Basil interprets passages in a manner that gives shape to the metaphysical reality of the triune operations disclosed in metaphorical and or figurative expressions. Citing Psalm 33, 6, which says, The heavens were made by the word of the Lord, and all the stars by the breath of his mouth. Basil notes, The word then is not a mere significant impression on the air, borne by the organs of speech, nor is the spirit of his mouth a vapor emitted by the organs of respiration, but the word is he who was with God, John 1, 1. And the spirit of the mouth of God is the spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, John 15, 26. End quote. Basil's interpretive maneuver, which we see through Epinoia, is key to understanding the oneness of God in his operations, showing that the figurative contains a metaphysical literalness in the divine work of God. Our interpretation of Psalm 33, 6 reveals that the Lord gives order, the Son creates, the Spirit confirms. Basil clarifies the work of the Spirit, observed earlier as a work of perfecting, stating it is the confirming of firmness, unchangeableness, and fixity in good. His designation of the Spirit in creation and sustaining of the universe is the act of God that makes his creation good, i.e. a work of sanctification, being perfected in the Spirit. So that we do not confuse what Basil means, gosh, Basil, sorry, what Basil means by sanctification with that of a believer's sanctification and conforming to the image of Christ, Basil's use is to demonstrate that the order according to the goodness or purpose of each created thing, whereby it acts through a communion with the Spirit, the Spirit's full presence to a created thing, empowering it to act proper to its nature. Challenging his opponents who claim the Spirit is not the divine essence, Basil writes, It results that if by your argument you do away with the Spirit, the hosts of the angels are disbanded and the dominions sorry, are disbanded, the dominions of archangels are destroyed, all is thrown into confusion, and their life loses law, order, and distinctness. For how are angels to cry, Glory to God in the highest, without being empowered by the Spirit? For no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Good concluding point. Now in chapter 18, Basil contends for the monarchia of God, or the monarchia, however you want to say it, which is the common patristic expression for the divine oneness, divine unity opposed to the error of tritheism and polytheism. So in the Monarchia, Basil specifies the Trinitarian formula. There is one God and Father, the only begotten, and one Holy Ghost. We proclaim each of the hypostases singly, or singly, however you want to say that, or you can say singularly, I guess. And when count we must, we do not let an ignorant arithmetic carry us away to the idea of a plurality of gods. So in this confession... Basil notes the affirmation of the persons, but within a monarchical schema. The Son is in the Father and the converse, one form or nature, both one in essence and will. The monarchy is not two gods, Basil writes, because we speak of a king and of the king's image and not two kings. The, maj the majesty is not cloven in two, nor the glory divided, both exercising sovereignty as one and receiving praise and glory as one. The Spirit likewise is singly conjoined to the Monarchia, consisting of the Blessed Trinity. The Spirit is not of rank among creatures, but is fully God of God, one with the three, through the one, though the one is dis in, uh, <laughs> though the one is distinctly the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So the scriptures speak of the Spirit's origin as that of procession from God, not as a creature who comes into being from God through his creative energy, like a, a, a force, which the, the Jehovah's Witnesses would say, right? But he proceeds from God. His procession is not generation like that of the sun, otherwise there would be two sons. And if you remembered, this is why the Eastern Orthodox hold a monarchical view of the Trinity, because they're saying if there's two or three that have the, the unoriginate or the uncaused state, then we ultimately have three or two. We have a plurality of, of gods. So again, the Son proceeds from the Father, whereas the Spirit, the Spirit, 
um, spirates from the Father distinctly. Of course, again, the Western view says that the Spirit spirates comes from the Father and the Son. That's where that distinction comes that we talked about earlier. Um, so but the, the, the Spirit proceeds or, or is spirates. So we say the Son pr proceeds from the Father, but we use the, the, the procession of the Spirit. We say spirated from the mouth of God. Uh, if you go back to that Psalm 33, 6, right? Um, the spirit or the word, you know, proceeds from the mouth of God in the creative agency. So these attributions of the persons are relations of origin, which indicate the identity of each person by the imminent relations to one another. We must not refer to a human mode of relation, seeing that the relations of persons are indicative of a time when the relations did not exist and then come into existence at some point. That's a temporal or a creature way of looking at things. Rather, the eternal essence has always been, and the relations have always been as well. The imminent relations are ineffable. Nevertheless, we speak of them in this manner so that they are safeguarded. That way we don't have three gods. We don't have three distinct beings that are separate from each other. The Spirit works by illuminating creatures to fix their gaze on Christ, the beauty of the image of the invisible God, as the Spirit enlightens us, we are drawn up to the glory of Christ. The inseparable Spirit of the Trinity bestows on creatures the love and the vision to know God, which is a knowledge from within, not a natural knowledge of God as attained through nature. In this intimate knowing, the Spirit shows the glory of the only begotten, and on true worshipers he in himself bestows the knowledge of God. Basil sees the Spirit's work as a conduit of relations between the triune God and creatures, whereby the goodness, glory, holiness, and dignity of the Father and the Son extend through the Spirit. The result of this reveals the hypostasis of the Godhead while retaining the oneness of the divine essence. The operations of the Spirit are ineffable, and it is through the operations that we perceive the energia, the energy, right, the divine energia of the divine essence. And our ability to contemplate God in the Blessed Trinity is a specific work of the Spirit, who is inseparable from the Father and the Son, and is why we can only know and predicate anything about God, as the Apostle writes. Now, God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except his Spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. End quote. That's from 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 11. Because only the Son and the Spirit fully know God, it is only by the Son in the Spirit that creatures come to truly, though not fully, exhaustively, know God. So, that wraps up our discussion on Basil of Caesarea. I hope it was very helpful. I need to show this slide again in case again you want to read some of these works, which kind of delve a little bit more into their writings. But I would, as always, I prefer to go to the um, primary sources. So you can find uh, on the Spirit, you can find online, you can fi find it free. Um, so just look up for uh, Saint Basil on the Spirit. Uh, you shall find it. Um, you can find um, you know printed versions as well. But again. Uh, Go to the primaries. I, I, I think it's great to read these guys. I have benefited greatly from them, but one thing that is not done enough in our modern context is not go to the primary sources. Too many uh, you know, make it judgments on, uh, on a source through a secondary source. You want to avoid that as much as possible. But again, these guys are very helpful because they have a background in reading all of this literature that maybe we do not have, and they're going to really help us kind of orient our mind to um, a particular understanding approach to these guys, historically speaking, so they're very helpful from that standpoint, and to really gain ex and you know, bring us back to what the early church fathers taught on this stuff. So, anyways, again, uh, hope you had a helpful time. Hope it was helpful for you, and we will see you on the next lecture. Take care.